Okay, great. So we'll um, we'll flip back to Pierre. So somebody was asking, what is the main takeaway from the final slide uh, of the activity model section of your talk, Pierre? Uh, I would say the main takeaway message is that it is complicated. It is very complicated to um, to adjust the solution models, and uh, we have some uh, options, but. Uh, I think we should uh, acknowledge the complexity and that's I think the main message is we should acknowledge the complexities and maybe the best approaches are not uh, uh, compatible with uh, the modern software solutions so we have to acknowledge that sometimes we can't uh, fit everything. I think that that's my main uh, takeaway message on that one. Excellent. No, that's great. Concise. That's, that's brilliant. Um, a, a couple more questions about the experimental data. Um, what standard state property can we precisely measure with these experimental data? I think this is probably earlier in your slide deck. Yeah, I may, I, I, I may have a, one more slide for that. Um, okay. So yes, the, the shame is that we can't measure directly the upper and Gibbs energy, uh, but we can measure part of it. And here I try to summarize what, uh, what is possible and uh, basically, the standard enthalpy of formation of phase, uh, so the change of enthalpy during the formation of one mole of the substance from its constituent elements with all substances in their form in, in their standard state, can be measured to some extent with solution calorimetry, but it's usually not precise enough, and this is why uh, this variable is used as as the main variable to adjust at the end of the dataset based on indirect experiments. The standard entropy, there are two parts inside. There is the third law entropy plus a configurational term. And usually you can uh, measure the third law entropy using precise low temperature calorimetry. There, there are a couple of papers, recent papers on that. And they, they managed to, uh, to have a, a very accurate and precise measurement of the third law entropy. And the configurational term can be measured to some extent with some uh, X-ray uh, diffraction. That would be the entropy of this order. Uh, for the heat capacity, it is quite straightforward to, to measure the heat capacity over, um, uh, um, a, a, at, at a constant pressure of a range of temperature. And this is usually uh, precise and accurate, at least up to temperature of 550 degrees. And above 550 degrees, the precision accuracy is uh, decreasing a bit. But there is a large variety of calorimetric techniques. And for the volume, it's, it's quite now, to, nowadays, it's quite easy to measure with x ray diffraction of a range of pressure and temperature conditions. So that would be a summary of what you, you can uh, measure and what you can't. And so to follow up from that, somebody asked that the um, do the uncertainties that we derive or the uncertainties on these experimental data, are they affected by the, the rate um, since natural processes take much longer and occur at slower rates than we would be using in these laboratory experiments? Do they take into account for that? Uh, so you mean the temperature? Is that? Yes, I suppose so. Yeah. Because the, so there are two points. Huh? First, uh, uh, first um, of course, experiments are uh, run at high temperature because to, to have a, um, of course, to, 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 to try to converge to equilibrium. So usually experiments are only run at high temperature. And then when you want to, to use the model or the, the database at low temperature, there is some extrapolation. And the other uncertainty because become, uh, becomes very important. I have an extra slide as well to show you this effect. This is an example of a, a bracketing experiment uh, for the reaction Grossula plus kyanite uh, plus quartz equal anortite. And you see that the experiment, the range, uh, they are above 800, uh, even 900 degrees C. So then if you want to extrapolate to lower temperature where we need uh, the properties of those phases, uh, you need to have um, an uncertainty that is as small as possible on the fit. And this is a comparison between the uncertainty in the mathematical programming. If you take the feasible region, it's a bit smaller than the feasible region. And you see that then it becomes quite high at low temperature. On this side, that would be the bias using the Bayesian statistic. And you see that the, the uncertainty envelope would be much smaller. But yes, most of the experimental constraints are at high temperature. Excellent, great. That was a really good explanation, Pierre. 
Okay, I might switch back to, to Dave Waters now. This is a, a kind of more overview question that I think is something that will come up throughout the workshop. Why is a phase diagram often referred to as a pseudo section and not just a, a section or another, another term? Do you have any thoughts on that? And anyone else can feel free to chip in if, if need be. That's a question you might want to ask Roger Powell. Um, uh, and in fact, um, he's got an answer for that in the materials that, uh, that, it, that he has um, published. And um, the idea is that um, uh, you have the concept of a total phase diagram, um, which you know, is multi-dimensional. Multi um, and the idea of a, for example, a pseudo binary diagram is that you're plotting on it things, um, compositions of things that do not lie in the plane of the section. And so by a pseudo section, Roger means a section through the total phase diagram, um, but the compositions of the materials that we're actually plotting on it do not lie in that plane. And, and, and okay, it's pretty difficult to mentally encompass uh, you know, a, 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 a volume of hyperspace with lots and lots of dimensions and a section through it. Um, but that's essentially what, uh, what, uh, uh, what he means. And that's why he um, coined, uh, did he coin it? I'm not sure whether he coined it. Anyway, that's why he uses the term pseudo section. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not ideal in some ways uh, uh, the, because uh, you know, the, the connotations of the word pseudo, um, you know, it makes it look as if you're doing something um, uh, not quite, not quite right. <laughs> it's a, it's a fake diagram, and of course, it's not a fake diagram. <laughs> um, it's, a, it, it's our attempt to approximate uh, the instability fields of mineral assemblages. So, uh, um, I think uh, that that's why, why really, um, among the panel, we agreed that. Um, uh, you know, we're trying to avoid the word pseudo section if possible, um, while recognizing that a lot of people out there will want to call these pseudo sections. Okay, another question here from at the start, you talked about these different versions of thermocalc. Um, and why have there been so many changes or appears to be as we've come <laughs> into thermocalc version 3.5? And what are the actual improvements? And I've got a follow up question once you've kind of, I think, gone for that. Oh, right, yeah. Um, well, uh, a number of factors, really, I think it, 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 was, it, it was high time to do a little bit of reform, and there were really two reasons for that. Um, one is just, uh, you know, a tidying up operation, because, um, you know, uh, I think Roger always admitted that, the, you know, the, the code was quite complicated. Um, uh, and uh, Basically, there was some simplification going on behind the scenes. Um, and while that simplification and rationalization was going on, um, it was also important to kind of make the code a little bit more forward looking. And one sort of forward looking thing uh, that one might want to do is, um, which I didn't really emphasize when I was talking about the interface, um, is that it's still basically necessary for you to sit there in front of a screen and, uh, and, and answer some of the questions. It's not all perfectly automated. And of course, down the line, it would be much better if, if everything was automated and you could simply um, feed a script file to maybe some other package and get it to call Thermocalc and do various things. And that is something they're very much working on at the moment is how to interface um, Thermocalc in various ways <clears throat> with them. Um, other ways of calculation that can um, you know, produce the same sort of interaction with, for, for, you know, for people who are looking at geodynamics as they can currently do with perplex, for example. So uh, they're very much thinking about that. Um, the other is, um, so, so it's you know, um, uh, tidying, up the, tidying up the source code, um, tidying up the uh, scripts and the way the scripts work to make them you know, more flexible and more automatable. Um, and certain things that are happening um, with the uh, solution models as well that needed some tightening up and uh, uh, and, and, and reorganization as well. So, uh, so th those are the reasons why they needed to do it. Um, what are the improvements? Um, well, okay, a program should run better if, uh, if uh, some of the complexity and duplications out of it. It should be clearer what you have to do in order to get a result. 
Um, some of those things are going to be unseen by the user, but ultimately better for uh, maintenance, for their maintenance of the code and, um, uh, and more systematic presentation for us when we're using the software. Um, they say that um, uh, do gmin has improved um, uh, and is faster. And I think that's true as far as I, it might just be that I've got a faster machine nowadays. <laughs> so I haven't done, haven't done too much testing, but it seems that that's probably true. Um, there are other changes that uh, perhaps, um, ch uh, I, you know, are, are things that will affect us in the way we use the program. Um, in that, for example, average P or average T as it is now, rather than average PT, now expects you to convert your mineral compositions to these X, Y, Z variables so that they can be implemented by the solution models. And uh, you could say, well, is this an improvement? At one level it is because it ties in what you're doing with the solution models. Um, the other is not entirely because for some minerals, um, what happens is that the real mineral compositions in the rocks that you have got don't necessarily fit as well as you would like them to into the solution models. And in some cases they can actually wreck um, the, uh, uh, the X, Y, Z parameters that um, get used, which are based on your, uh, uh, based on your you know, um, faithful equilibrium analysis will end up giving you calculated compositions that are nowhere near where they should be. They basically do not reproduce the, 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 uh, uh, the compositions that you put in. Um, and uh, so basically, it, it, in some cases, it highlights this issue with the solution models. And that can mean that you will get results from average P um, that are inferior to what you got with the older method. And, and uh, you know, um, I, I've, I've discovered several examples of that kind of behavior. So uh, um, it, it is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, and so for those sort of cases, if I think something is a bit dodgy is going on there, I will drop back and I will use activities that have been perhaps more crudely calculated. Um, but I know they will reflect things that um, the uh, thermocult routine will then give me back an answer which is most, you know, which is more suited to the data that I put in. Sorry, that's quite a complicated thing to get across, but um, no, 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 that's great. That, 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 that is that is an aspect of the new way of doing um, um, average P and average T that um, uh, I guess people will become aware of. But I've become aware of it fairly soon. With time, excellent. Okay, maybe I will switch back and ask Pierre a question if you're still there, Pierre. Yes. Excellent. So a slightly longer one here from earlier in the session. Session. Um, uh, you showed how we can view the uncertainty of estimating the pressure of stability of quartz and coazite, for example, between these two Gaussian curves. Um, how does the extent to which these phases can coexist metastably affect this uncertainty? And I think you just had this curve up again. Um, for example, if we could perfectly measure quartz and coazite, um, uh, where quartz and coazite are stable, sorry, without any uncertainty, we would still expect to see some overlapping pressures in which both can be stable. Is this overlap larger or smaller than the propagated uncertainties in the experiments? Sorry, that was a long one. I can summarize if need be. Okay, I'm going to show again my screen. Yes, okay. so something I, I didn't really mention about those experiments and mo most of the, the experiments is that those are uh, based on reaction reversal uh, bracketing experiment, which means that uh, we, we at uh, the 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 authors are checking that, uh, for example, for especially for the lower pressure bracket, uh, uh, we are not in presence of metastable quartz. So the strategy usually in this case is, uh, for example, first to to find the upper bracket where coezite is stable, and you know that. Uh, at let's say 600 degrees, if you wait for 20 hours at this pressure, then you would you, you are sure that you would form coezite, and then you you're gonna you, you're gonna run again a new experiments where you go to this condition for again 20 hours to make sure that you form coezite, and then you go back uh, at lower pressure conditions to see to make sure that you form quartz back from the coezite because the starting material is usually quartz, and you you want to make sure that you. You you have you are not in presence of a metastable quartz. So that would be the strategy to really try to 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 bracket the reaction, making sure that there is not too much of uh, there is no metastable phase. 
And for the uncertainties, uh, I, I probably partially answered to that in the, the, the fitting procedure about the uncertainty. It's a few slides after I can move. Uh, yeah, one of the problem uh, here is that, of course, the uncertainty is the, the maximum uncertainty is uh, defined by this feasible region. So if you if you have your uncertainty envelope that goes outside the feasible region, you overestimate your uncertainties. Yes. Excellent. Okay, there was another question. I'm not sure whether you answered it in the um, uh, in the chat. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But how important is it to include order disorder phenomena in the solution models? Uh, it is. It is very important, uh, especially for very specific um, for very specific cases. Uh, for example, how iron and magnesium are uh, partitioning between different crystallographic sites, and so there are some order disorder models that are. Uh, implemented in directly in the solution model and one of the one one of the example here is the in this ordered biotite that i mentioned in the y2014 model and this ordered biotite will uh, allow you to calculate the degree of ordering uh, between iron and magnesium in your uh, in your uh, in your biotite so that's one way to to handle this uh, Order disorder a phenomenon. There is a, a large series of paper on that topic by Roger Powell and Tim Holland, and I really recommend you to go through those papers. Okay, a slight change of topic, and I I think this is a I, maybe Dave or you or you can start answering this, and then Dave can finish. If you're working in an area with low grade metamorphism. Um, uh, do you have any suggestions? Can you use thermocalc? Uh, what are, what are, you know solution models, etc., are available? I, I assume is what it's getting at. Pierre, do you have any comments on that? Maybe we can switch to Dave afterwards. Yeah, I have some comments on that. So, in my understanding, most of the focus in the Holland and Powell database uh, were on the uh, moderate to high temperature metamorphism. So they didn't pay too much attention about the low grade phases. And uh, most of the other models that were developed to, um, to model low-grade metamorphism are compatible more with the Berman data set. And for example, here I, I gave you the example of the pseudoide that is a low-grade temperature chloride. It becomes quite important at a low temperature below 350, 400 degrees. And the pseudoide is, is not uh, implemented, is not incorporated in the solution model of chloride which means that you can't really model chloride at low temperature with the Holland and Poel database. And it's the same for the white mica. Uh, I showed you this example uh, in, at the end of the presentation on the muscovite uh, pyrophyllite uh, substitution. And it's exactly the same problem. The pyrophyllite, and remember, is very important when you want to model white mica at low pressure and temperature conditions. And this end member is not implemented in a solution model. Uh, for white mica in white et al. 2014. So I think that if you are interested in low-grade metamorphism, you should uh, take a look at the other groups that publish solution models that are really uh, focused on this uh, temperature and pressure region. That would be my answer. Excellent. Dave, what is anything to add there? Or? Uh, well, I, I can't improve on that um, because that is absolutely true, and particularly in low-grade rocks where you're looking at sheet silicates dominantly, you know, white micas, um, chlorite, and, uh, and and so on. Um, then you really do need to have all this compositional variability in because it, basically it's all you've got um, to uh, to constrain um, you know P's and T's in, in many circumstances. Yeah, and, and Pierre's absolutely right that. Um, the, there's a sort of medium to high temperature focus for the Arnold and Powell data set, um, <clears throat> which they haven't really explored back down to low temperatures because I think the priority was to move up temperature first into uh, suprasolidus calculations and uh, then further still into um, uh, with uh, with um, uh, you know igneous related um, problems and uh, uh, and and mantle. Um, mantle assemblages and so on. And, uh, I, I, and and I guess it's not really gonna go back down to low temperatures anytime soon. So you know, quite conceivably, we need, we need an alternative. Um, but, I mean, you, you, you will try, but you can get some odd results. I mean, uh, for example, I found to, to my um, amusement <clears throat> um, that if you leave the melt model in, 
you know, the sort of standard granitic haplogranic melt model um, in while you're calculating at, uh, you know, in high blue schist facies or low temperature eclogites, um, it reappears. And then when you look at it, you realize, oh, okay, um, this might not be too far from the truth because basically it's H2O with um, some uh, material dissolved in it. Um, but, um, you know, they, they didn't design the melt model that way. So, uh, um, you know, you can't really believe what you see. Um, uh, biotite tends to appear in strange places in that same region as well, where I don't really believe it occurs in nature. So, you know, these, these quirky things occur um, and you need to be aware of them and uh, aware of the limitations, sort of broad, broad PT limitations of uh, using the, uh, the models that uh, you have available. Excellent. Okay, I think that was a really thorough answer from the both of you. Um, uh, back again to, to Dave Waters here, ask it, somebody asking, how do you account in thermocalc for a fluid that isn't pure H2O, where you have, you know, immiscible or perhaps even immiscible fluids? Do you have any comment on that? Um, yes, well, the, the, the easy way um, is um, no, not to, not necessarily um, directly model that extra fluid component <clears throat> um, if you think that component is going to be dominantly CO2 because built in already is <clears throat> um, if you do um, uh, average P average PT for example um, it uh, will ask you whether your fluid is pure H2O or not <clears throat> and if it's not you have the option um, if fluid is present um, to say what is the proportion of H2O in this fluid and it assumes the rest is CO2 and introduces the non-ideal um, H2O CO2 model to do the calculation for you. Um, so, and uh, if you say that your um, assemblage is fluid absent, then it will ask you for an activity of H2O. Um, so there are ways with that inverse modeling um, to, to, to do that. I've not done very much um, forward modeling with um, with, with mixed fluids. I have done some H2O CO2 work and uh, but maybe some other of the panelists have, have done more on uh, mixed volatiles and um, uh, we may hear something more about that um, uh, with thermocalc or with other packages in, in later sessions. Yeah, you can use, um, I mean, you can <clears throat> adjust the activity of H2O, make a new H2O in member if you want a fixed activity calculation. Or you could. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you can you can tell it to use a fixed activity. In, uh, or you could use um, um, Holland Powell 2003 published a COH fluid model. Uh, so that does exist yep. in some of the fo files, uh, usually the older files for data set 5.5 is where I've seen them. Uh, and then Katie Evans ex expanded on that to a COHS fluid model. Uh, so there are. A variety yes, that's right. Yes. I, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That you can use in. Uh, the, that, that, that's right, Doug. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah. In fact, one of, one of my students used Katie Evans' models because um, he was looking at sulfide ore deposits and uh, uh, and wanted to use that. No, I've no personal experience myself, but they worked for him. So for AX versus the HPXEOS module, um, is the latter, so HPXEOS, also iterative? In the way it calculates so activities, I assume. Yes. Um, not quite sure I understand the question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a bit more. It says, and I've wondered how using an educated guess in AX could result at the end in a somewhat different output from inverse modeling and how to take the results. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not totally sure what it's getting yeah. at. It, uh, I'm, what, what? No, not, nor am I quite. Um, you, Using using AX is simply a matter of putting your own you know, preferred mineral analyses into the program, <clears throat> and it will uh, give you an activity which um, is uh, you know based on the models um, that based on the older models essentially. So I don't know whether um, uh, it uh, I don't I, actually the, the the test that I haven't run actually is to compare in detail some of the models which Tim Holland was incorporating from the um, most recent data sets to work with with data set 6.2 um, against um, how I would calculate them if I was using the axios. Um, 
so uh, I, don't, I don't know whether Tim made adjustments or compromises uh, in, in, in doing that. Um, if you're going to use data set 5.5 and use X, then you know you should get out something reasonable that is you know, at least consistent with data set 5.5. And um, I've had really some you know some some really quite good results. Um, uh, I've done a certain amount of comparison using the same samples between X and uh, data set 5.5, X and data set 6.2, and the X EOS and data set 6.2. And uh, yes, there are slight differences in the results, but they're actually much smaller than you would have thought. Um, so it's not, I, I guess it's just not too crucial. If you're going to use um, uh, um, average P, average PT, then it does not make a huge amount of difference, doesn't make a critical amount of difference, exactly which approach you use. And then that's kind of comforting. Um, but it might also be saying that the, uh, the, the uncertainties that we're using are, um, you know, are potentially smaller than they, than, than they are than, uh, than the ones that are actually propagated. And there are differences, it's just we can't see them. Excellent, great. Well, thanks very much, Dave Waters and Pierre, for answering a, another barrage of questions.